Hello everyone, we are live at North Carolina Central University for the B-Man Amplified Tour. This is our second stop and we're delighted to have Dr. Sierra Roach Gerald and future Dr. Jayla Calhoun for our awesome panelists, as well as our amazing networking session that took place afterwards. Let's jump right into the episode. Right, so the first question I have for both of you all is, when did you become interested in pursuing a career in medicine? You want to go first? You can go first. You can go first. Okay. Um, so mine is actually pretty interesting. I didn't. Um, <laughs> I actually wanted to be a WNBA basketball player um, and then teach in the off season because um, I really love kids. And then I came to Central. Um, I went to school of science and math for high school. Um, I had a lot of friends that came to Central, so that's what got me in the Central. Um, and came here, and they had a pre-med program, um, the early medical school selection program. And I pretty much had to decide between early education and chemistry. Um, I ended up choosing chemistry. I don't know how I had those as my two options. Um, and getting in that program really got me into the field of medicine. So I actually had no interest in Medicine just wanted to work with kids, and I still get to work with kids. Fantastic. Uh, for me, uh, when I started undergrad, I was actually a psych major. I thought I was going to get into psychology, so I wasn't really interested in being a physician, um, per se. But then I started taking psychology classes, and I was like, I actually don't like this very much. So <laughs> uh, I, I transitioned pretty quickly to being a pre-med. Um, and as a basketball student, I was in the training room quite a bit, and I would see, you know, the orthopedic uh, specialists in there, and they kind of just inspired me. I was like, I really kind of think what they're doing is cool, and I wanted to get into that, so that's why I decided to get into medicine. Awesome. So it sounds like for both of you, medicine wasn't necessarily the immediate path you thought you were going to take. That's all right. So what was that like, making that transition? Because I know a lot of students, sometimes they may pursue one path and realize this is not for me, but may be hesitant to change directions. What was that like for you, and what was kind of the tipping point to make you say it's okay to change? I guess I didn't actually change like majors or anything. Um, well, I went from chemistry to bio because to finish on time, I kind of had to switch majors. Um, but I think summer programs so, um, are a big thing, so... There's like the SMDP, there's a whole bunch of programs out there and I really enlighten all of you guys to look up. I know we had health careers back then, I think they've changed the name of it now, um, as far as like the pre-med, but um, I really enlighten everybody to like look into summer programs and get that exposure. Um, I know everybody's like, oh, it's summertime, I get my break. Um, but honestly, like, challenge yourself and just do like six weeks in a summer program um get that experience because you'll get that you'll get that experience then that you won't get later in life um and so me doing a summer program every summer kind of got me into seeing that i wanted to do medicine um for me i actually was going to say similarly like a summer program so after i finished uh, undergraduate undergraduate was a blur for me um when i changed my major to biology um also a blur. I don't even know if I really consciously made that decision. I was just like, I'm doing it. Um, <laughs> I finished in three years. So um, I feel like when I was done, when I actually graduated, I still wasn't 100% sure and clear about the path I wanted to take. And I actually did the MED program at UNC. And for me, that was kind of my transformative experience where I was like, okay, no, this is something I'm qualified for, I'm capable of, and something that I would really enjoy doing. And can I piggyback on that? Yeah, of course. Um, so, and one thing that helps, um, I ended up doing the one at ECU, but that helps you get into those medical programs. So they get to see you that summer before, um, and so they get to see your work ethic, um, and sometimes you can get letter recommendations there um, and stuff like that, but that networking that you do, because um, you actually work with the actual medical students, so they're usually the ones that are going to be your tutors or your teachers, um, and so getting that experience in those programs are... It's beyond, beyond um, incredible. So I definitely um, piggyback what she's saying. Um, sorry to piggyback <laughs> again, but um, you yeah, know, in the MED program specifically, I know we had teachers who taught us in the MED program who were teachers when I was yep. at my first year of medical school. So definitely the, the crossover is there. 
And also, like you were saying, it helps you in the application or when you're applying, because <coughs> when I applied to UNC, um, as an MED um, alumni, as an MED alumni, my name was already put into a different category um, as soon as I applied there. Yeah. Awesome. So you all both made a great point about summer programs and the importance of doing those to not only get to know what you're interested in and making sure that your interest is something you already are familiar with and getting some extra exposure, but then really building connections at the university and really taking that opportunity to network with the individuals there. Um, what other things do you think are important for students besides summer programs as they're thinking about pursuing health professional school and medical school? Um, I would say keep yourself like your applicant, your application broad. So whatever your interest is. So I volunteered at CC Spalding like for three years um, and just taught in the kindergarten class. So whatever is your interest, um, they like to see that you have an interest and that you're going to be committed to it. Not, hey, I went and volunteered five hours. Yay, give me a kudos. Um, they don't want to see that. They want to see that you did something for a prolonged amount of time. Um, and so even there's a buttload of hospitals around here uh, that you can also volunteer. And there's a whole network of physicians around that you can get shadowing um, experience. I would definitely recommend any of that um, as things that you can consider. Uh, yeah, I would definitely say in terms of experiences and getting experiences, quality over quantity, like you're saying, you really want to be able to speak about those experiences and speak to how they transformed you as a person versus just having it on your application, just something you did. Um, as well as that, I would like to say that what I would like you to get from me, at least, is that this is going to be a hard experience. It's difficult. If it was easy, everybody would do it, right? So building your network of people who you know you can lean on and who are your support system now, early, it's really important to kind of supporting yourself in the future and making sure that you're setting yourself up for success. And building those connections. Um, mm -hmm. We had, I think it was Dr. Hardy, um, was over like the honors program and he would like pay for, he would give like one scholarship a year to get, take an MCAT class. Um, and so building those networks and like reaching out um, and it's going to be expensive. Um, that's one thing people do not tell you. It's mm -hmm. going to be expensive mm -hmm. um, from application. You think MCAT is going to be expensive? Wait till y'all see a board exam. Um, oh. It's going to be, I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's like 2500 um, But it is expensive. Um, and so go ahead and um, start building those networks, um, looking for scholarships. You'd be surprised how many people want to give back um, and help, especially minorities, and help and say, hey, you don't have the funds to study for the MCAT? All right, let me buy your books. Um, so you can get that. So build those networks. I love that. So from networking to making sure you're thinking about summer programs to making sure you're thinking about shadowing experiences, one thing I think students may need to also consider is making sure you can talk about the experiences very eloquently. You know, when I'm in the, I'm on the admissions interview committee at UNC, and one thing that I notice, some students are really strong about knowing what they did, how they did it, why, what impact it had, how it impacted them. Other students can kind of just mention something and then don't have anything to back it up. So to, to your point, making sure you've been committed to something, but then really know how to speak about it and what you did in that experience is really important, too. And um, a class that they make you take here, I can't remember the name of it, but professionalism. Mm -hmm. It matters. Do not go in there and say people by their first name. Call them doctor. If you don't know if they're a doctor, call everybody doctor. Call them Mr. or Mrs. Um, but keeping that respect is so important. Like, do not treat it like it's one of your friends and LOL. Um, don't, don't do that when you're in the interview. Um, it's going to go a long way, good or bad, depending on how you do. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about what challenges did you all experience, you know, before med school or thinking about the transition to med school? Because as you said, it's hard. At times it's expensive when we're paying for tests and things. So what challenges can you share with the students that you may have encountered um, prior to med school or even along the journey at any point? Okay. Um, so I, I tell this story and I won't say who the, person, the person's name, but uh, at one point when I was applying for medical school the second time because I didn't get in my first time because it happens sometimes you fail and sometimes you have to pick yourself back up right so the second time I was applying again and I wouldn't have this meeting with this person who's supposed to be reviewing my application and they looked me dead in the eye and were like you should save your money don't even worry about applying you're not going to get in this year and that broke my heart I was like so sad <laughs> um, and it was crazy because I walked right across the hall 
to Dr. Costantini, and I was probably crying. And Dr. Costantini was like, who is he? What is he doing? <laughs> like, and she like talked me out of it, snapped me out of it. Um, and that experience, I mean, obviously it made me feel bad in that moment, but, and she took, she snapped me out of it. But for me, it was like, going forward, I need to be that person for myself. No, 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 wait a minute. Take this, if it's, if it's valid criticism, take that criticism, but don't take it personal. Um, and if you take that personal, take it personal for half a second, get, up, get over it. We gotta move on, we gotta keep pushing. And you know what, I did make it into medical school. So, but I, did, I, I, I could have let that, you know, really discourage me and withdraw my applications, but I didn't. So, you know, here we are today. <laughs> um, I would say mine would be more when I was in residency. Um, so I kind of went straight through. Um, started to actually struggle in medical school. Um, I love kids. Um, and I actually failed the peak shelf. Um, learn, I failed like three shelves back to back to back. And then I ended up learning that I have dyslexia. Um, and the reason I was getting so far is because I could read fast, but I actually was actually struggling, but I was a fast reader, so that's how I was compensated for so long. Um, and so in medical school, I mean in residency, you have different steps you have to take. So I like had failed this step like three times, was about to get kicked out. Um, I was like 45 seconds short on my PT test. Um, and I had had to meet with the dean. He said, well, you got less than 5% chance of passing everything in the last month. So pretty much you should pack up your bags. Um, but when you have praying families and I always believe in God first, um, anything can happen, pass everything. Um, but I still, I mean, you're gonna struggle. Um, but don't necessarily give up, okay? Um, and you'll have to figure out different ways to kind of conquer those things. So um, I have to take more time to study. Um, I'd like to take a year to study for my boards now. Um, and so you'll figure out those things, but you're gonna have challenges. Unfortunately, I mean, maybe there is somebody in medical school who never failed the test, but there is probably nobody in medical school who's never failed a test. Like you're gonna, you're gonna have your ups and downs, you just can't give up um, and continue to push yourself. I love that. Go ahead. I was just gonna say, I like to remind myself whenever I do feel it's like, you're not the only person. You're literally just, you, it's impossible for you to be the first person and only person to pass this. No one's gonna tell you in medical school that they failed, but surely someone in that room felt with you. So, I mean, like I said, take a moment to feel bad about it, but at the end of the day, you gotta, that's not useful to you. You gotta move on, you gotta keep pushing, you gotta do what's useful, and that's keep, keep moving. Absolutely. And that's a common theme. I think students don't realize that it's not perfect. No journey is perfect. And I think people, we know the importance of being a great doctor has nothing to do with the tests that you take and the classwork that you do, not from the sake of being competent, proficient, but what it takes to actually be a doctor and take care of patients is not the grade you get on a test. And so that's something I just want to keep um say to you all as well because there will be times where you do great and there'll be some times where you don't do as good as you would like to but that doesn't mean you have to stop or feel like you are unable to accomplish your goals because we have amazing people sitting right here who are accomplishing those goals who've also uh, had ups and downs like myself as well um and so i think it's important to know that and as you move through your journeys that it's okay to hit bumps in the road and keep going um so i want to talk a bit about when you were here at central what were some of the highlights for you? And if you had to get a student to come here to learn and be ready to go to med school, what would you say to that future student as Eagles? I don't know that I was ready for that question. <laughs> My academic highlight. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I was ready for that question. Um, so I feel like my, um, the friends and the, the mentors that you'll meet at Central, you won't meet anywhere else. Um, so I still, I'm Facebook friends with my um, professors. Like, I still talk to my professors. We have a group, we have a 18 person Central group chat. Um, we still are connected. All of us weren't necessarily science majors, but those bonds that you build um, in undergrad, you will keep those. Um, having said with my husband, I met him, well, we knew of each other at Central. We just didn't date at Central. <laughs> um, but um, so those like connections that you'll make, um, I don't. I don't think you can take away from that. And the HBU experience is just like no other. Um, so I know you can say that now that you've been to a different school. But going to a different school, like I went to ECU for a medical school, it's going to be a totally different atmosphere. 
Um, and so just having that experience at some point in your life, I think is amazing. Um, having this like small classroom like this and not 500 people in your classroom, um, it just means a lot. Hello, everyone. Are you enjoying the episode so far this week? Well, I'm excited to announce that this week's episode is sponsored by the BMed app. That's right. You heard it. The Black Med Connect app. This app will be for any black or brown pre-medical students, medical students, residents, fellows, and attendings, even for institutions. We're in the process of developing our app and we wanted to share it with you now. So if you're interested in receiving updates on when the BMed app will be available to the world, then head on over to bmedconnect.com slash app, A-P-P, and join the waitlist. Let's jump right back into the episode. Um, and that's one thing I would tell, like, even my child um, and recommend them going to Central. Um, I always recommend people go to the HBCUs um, and keeping it alive. Um, equally, I think, yeah, like, solid experience here. I really loved it here. I would say for me, my most proud and best moment is when I presented my thesis, uh, my graduate thesis, uh, when I finished that, I was so happy. Man, it was really rough. Dr. <laughs> Constantini was yelling at me, sending me very angry emails about my writing techniques. And <laughs> it was just really nice to like have that all culminate in a presentation that went really, really well. And it was really well received. And it felt really good to you know, reach that mountaintop, at least for, the, for a graduate's degree. Um, and then she took us out after for drinks and food. So that again speaks to the fact that you are building relationships here that I think will carry over. Like, if I, have, if I have any problems or if I ever need anything, I know I can, you know, count on her and reach out to her for that. I love that. Now, I'm not an eagle, but I'm a rattler. So, fam, you, I'm going to do my little rattler. I know I'm in a room full of eagles. But <laughs> <laughs> the community, right? What you guys are speaking to is the community that you have and the bonds that really are never broken. So cherish your moments while you're here and the connections you're building because you will rely on and come back to these individuals uh, for years to come. So... Mm -hmm. um, I want to ask you all about if you've ever experienced imposter syndrome or that feeling of, you know, not feeling, am I supposed to be here or do I deserve to be in this space? And what was that like for you and how did you overcome or for me, I know it still happens now. Uh, how do you actively continue to overcome that feeling of imposter syndrome? Um, for me, I, I know I was saying this earlier, but we, like I'm really blessed in my class at UNC. We do have like a large uh, large population of black women in our class. There's like 20. So I can always, I know I can reach out to them if I ever feel that way because they're going to slap me and say, no, we're all meant to be here. <laughs> um, but really, I, I like, like I said, building and using your support systems is really important. And for me, that my biggest supporter has always been my dad. So if I call my dad, I know he's going to give me a pep squad cheerleader routine for the ages and tell me how great I am. So for me, if I ever feel like that, I, I like to call him. Um. I, I agree with you. I, I don't think you can ever really get rid of that kind of syndrome. Mm -hmm. I would say I get it more now um, than I did at Central, at ECU. It just kind of depends on, you know, the atmosphere of that school or where you're at. Um, Y'all can quote these facts later because I don't know 100 percent. But the African-American population in medicine hasn't really changed. Mm -hmm. It like, hangs between 5 and 8 um, percent. So you're not going to see... 80 people in your class um it's just the numbers just aren't there and then women in medicine is like one or two percent um and so once you get out i shouldn't say real world but once you start getting into your own career and your own paths you're not going to see necessarily as many african-american physicians or as many um women um in your fields and especially when you start going into leadership um it gets slimmer and slimmer it's more of a a guy's feel, you know, women are having kids and, and it's just, just the way medicine just hasn't changed, um, which is why things like this um, make good networking um, experiences for you um, to be the one to conquer that. So I don't necessarily think I've actually conquered it. I think you're going to face it no matter where you are. You just got to have that resiliency to get through it um, until the next opportunity comes. Absolutely, absolutely. I, just to piggyback on that, I think as you go from med school, where you may have 20, I know we had 25 in my class at Duke, but that was rare. The next class only had six people. Mm -hmm. So each year may be different, 
when I was a resident, I was the only black woman in my residency class, even though I was in Atlanta, Georgia. So you will come across times where you may be the only one. And you that's why it's really important to like savor where you are and enjoy what you're doing right now. Because as you go along, to your point, we only represent about 5% of all physicians. And then when you break that out by specialties, some specialties are less than 5% for African-Americans. And so you will be a trailblazer in whatever area you pursue. Um, and so with that, I would love to hear about what a day in the life looks like for you now um, with your experiences. Um, well, let's just say a day in the last few months. <laughs> okay. So I've been a you dedicated can, you for it. Say, how about you can go for the last two years? Okay. okay. <laughs> but you can go first. You want me to go first? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so let's see. It really just depends on <laughs> where life is. Um, but I would say... Um, Right now, usually I'll just pretend I'm on round. So I still do like full scope where I round at the hospital, I'll see newborn babies, I'll see pediatric patients, and then I'll go to the clinic afterwards. Um, and I'll probably be at the hospital for two or three hours, then I'll go to the clinic, um, have patients in the morning, get a little lunch, um, and then I'll have a full afternoon, and then I'll go back to the hospital. Um, and round on whoever was born afterwards. Um, I am in like rural pediatrics, um, and so there's not many full scope pediatrics. As everybody's kind of shifting into like you either do hospital, you do clinic, um, but not necessarily all of it anymore. Um, it's funny that you say that because in the next year I plan to transition to just hospital work um, because I'm tired of doing both. <laughs> uh, so, um, but that's how kind of how my day usually is. But I also do. Um, a lot of teaching. I teach like NRP. I work with the residents. I actually have to prepare a lecture for them for Thursday. Um, it really just depends on the day with me. Um, so I also do a little locums too. So like this weekend I went to like another hospital and cover for them. Um, they're not necessarily in the country but usually it's a lot of small hospitals that need coverage whether people are out sick or they just don't have a doctor right now. Um, and so it really just depends on my day, but I actually kind of do a little bit of everything um, throughout the day. Okay. It's a pretty busy day. <laughs> okay. Um, so for me as a medical student, uh, our first two years at UNC are like book work, uh, more didactic learning stuff. Uh, so for me, 8 to 12 every day, I'm a class goer. We don't have mandatory class. Um, I know it changed for the new curriculum, but for us, we didn't have mandatory class. Um, so 8 to 12, I would go, though, and then I would take a small break, and let's say it's a Wednesday. So I have PCC, which is our patient-centered care course, where we would talk about, like, clinical care. Um, and I, we would do that from 2 to 5, and then go home and probably study for a couple hours, get ready for the next day. I, we were saying that my schedule's changed because I've been studying for one of our big exams for the past, like, two months. And so now my schedule's just been like, wake up at 8 a.m. and study to five, so. <laughs> but one thing I wanna add in there is, don't forget to cherish the things that are important to you. Um, so throughout like medical school, throughout um, even undergrad for me, through residency, um, going to church was important to me. Um, so I always fit that in um, and had that in my schedule. I'm also an OCD person. Don't ask my husband how many schedules I make, and it's a little bit crazy. Um, but whatever's important to you, make sure you have time for that, whether it's family, um, children, um, visiting family. Make sure you set down that time um, for those important things, whether it's reading 30 minutes or watching your favorite TV show, whatever it is that matters to you, because that's going to keep you sane. Um, and so whatever it is, don't forget to add that into your schedule. Exercise, forgot about that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, don't forget to add all that stuff in there. I love that, especially because as you go, there will be times where you can't do as much of what you love, and then there'll be other times where you can fit it in more. But the whole time, you got to try to find at least a little window to spend time with family, friends. To, for me, prayer, like you said, faith going to church was big for me, too. Um, and then from a studying perspective, I know you mentioned, you know, you said eight to five. You said it kind of quietly. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> but when you're studying for your step exams, it takes that much dedication. And to your point of going to class, some people will be OK with virtual and med school. But for me, I was a class goer, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I felt like going to have the material, I would listen to the lectures that were, you know, given to us, but then go to class because it helped. 
Um, so ultimately, I say all that to say, find what works for you all with studying, because it will be a step up from what you're doing now to medical school. The amount of studying you have to do really does change. So building on those study habits early is important for sure. Like, you might have a whole semester here. You're going to get that in, like, two weeks. Yeah, that's two or three weeks. Um, it's going to be, like, one two, one test. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you got to, and you're going to have four or five of those classes like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so whatever study habits that are good or bad um, is you're trying to, you know, figure out what works for you. Um, start working on them, building those. Um, and it's not going to be, I'm going to start studying at 8 p.m. the night before the test because you, you might won't. as well cancel it. It ain't going to work. Just don't go. Yeah. <laughs> don't take that. Don't, yeah. don't do that. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so I have one, if you had to lead these individual students with one parting word of wisdom before they ask some questions, um, what would you leave them with? And then I have one last bolus round question I'll explain in a minute too. Um, I guess I would say um, pray, be consistent. Um, enjoy what you do um, and just continue to push yourself continue to strive high Um, I would say that there is value in your perspective and always know that you have value in your perspective so going forward always be confident and stay true to yourself we hope you enjoyed this week's episode of the B-Man Amplified Tour. This is part one at North Carolina Central University. Students had amazing questions, and we'd like to thank Dr. Sierra Roach Gerald and future Dr. Jayla Calhoun. Until next time, always remember to dream without limits. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to Black Med Connect.